This morning we continue our look at the family and how we can grow as a family. Every one of us understand that our families aren't perfect. It, I, I don't talk to anybody who can say, you know, I'm the perfect husband, I'm the perfect wife, I'm the perfect child. I, I don't talk about anybody who says, my parents were perfect. You know, every one of us look and we realize, just like we talked about last week, as a married couple, we're incompatible. And as a family, we've all got faults. We've all got issues. And God knows that. God knows that we're broken people living in a broken world that need a personal God that's involved regularly to help us through life. Peter is looking at that this morning, and we're thinking about the aspect of when we are growing as a family, when we're growing personally in our relationships and corporately as a family in our relationships, we need specific things that we put into our lives as traits. And so this morning, I want us to be thinking about that aspect. We're looking at 2 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to be begin reading at verse 4. So follow along with me as I read. For by these he has granted us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers in the, of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now, for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence. And in your moral excellence, knowledge. And in your knowledge, self-control. And in your self-control, perseverance. And in your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. And your brotherly kindness, love. And if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We talked this week about some things we need to add into our life. You know, many times we kind of look at our Christian walk and we go, I've got Jesus, and that's enough. And the reality is Jesus is the thing that completely changes us from death to life, brings us from darkness to light. It, he revolutionizes our life. But for us to live out our Christian walk as if that's all we need to do, we've misunderstood what our Christian walk is about. Because Peter is addressing and he's saying, hey guys, you are people of faith. In, in verse 3, he talks about the fact that we are people, are same, in verse 1, he talks about we're the same, we have the same type of faith that Peter had. We believe in the same Jesus Peter believed in. We have the same saving graces that Peter did. But Peter says, to your faith, I want you to add something. And I want you to diligently pursue this. And see, this is where we miss it. Many of us go through our Christian walk as an individual and as a family, not diligently pursuing the things we need to put into our life. We're so influenced by our world, so overwhelmed by what we see around us that we many times look at it from the standpoint of, I I've got to have what they've got. I've got to have what my business demands. I've got to follow the guidelines that the world establishes, but we don't. So Peter says, hey, look, you and I live as people of promise. We have the same promise as Peter. We have the same promise as Paul. We have the same promise as all the early Christians. Today, we have a saving faith in Christ. But Peter says, we also are participating in the divine nature of God. Now, that doesn't mean we become God. You and I never become God. 
But you and I, by participating in the divine nature of God, because of our relationship with God, are constantly being influenced by what God is doing. And so we begin to look like God more. We begin to sound like God more. We begin to act like God more. So that the world around us begins to see that there is something different in who we are. So Peter then jumps in and says, here's seven things you need to add to your relationship. We won't spend more than 10 minutes on each of these. (laughs) Oh, goodness. Some of you are thinking I'm serious there, aren't you? Okay. All right. Paul reminds Timothy of something in 1 Timothy 1, verse 5. He says, But the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart, a heart that's constantly being cleansed, and a good conscience, one that's sensitive to what God wants, and a sincere faith, a real faith in Jesus. So we want to be growing in that. Now, let me tell you two principles we need to think about from spiritual growth in our own lives. One is the fact that age doesn't matter. As a matter of fact, I know in every congregation throughout the world, there are people who are old and have been Christians most of their life who are totally immature believers because they've never diligently sought after the things of God. And I know also in every congregation, there are people who are fairly new in their faith in Jesus Christ that are very deep in a relationship with God and are growing in an amazing way. So age doesn't matter about spiritual growth. But the thing is, we need to all be involved in it because here's the second principle. You are growing as much spiritually as you desire. Hear that. You are growing as much spiritually as you desire. And Peter says, hey, if you will diligently seek after these things, you're going to have some excellent results. So let's look at these seven things. First, he talks about moral excellence. Now, this would be moral excellence. It's also spiritual courage is the mindset that is here. He said, this is one of the traits that we add. We make a decision to stand firm for God. One of the biblical examples that we have of this is Daniel. Daniel is taken away from his country when he's a young boy, or a young guy, a teenager, and he's carried off to another country. He's put in a culture that isn't like his. He's put in a godless place. He's not expected to do anything based on his religion or his God. He doesn't have any accountability structure around him. He has nobody watching to see whether or not he's going to be faithful. Nothing. So he's out there on his own. And what does Daniel do? He purposes in his heart, according to what we see in verse 8 of chapter 1 of Daniel, that he personally decides he doesn't want to do anything that will defile God. So in that type of relationship, we need to come to a place where we are like that. And you may go, well, pastor, I'm, I'm not even close to that because I've already failed. I've already not stood. I don't talk about Jesus at work. My, my coworkers don't even know I know Jesus. My, my family doesn't know I know Jesus. I'm not a person that's standing up. Listen, I want you to understand something. All of us are broken people. All of us are fallen people. All of us have failed at times. But today, would you please say, with all diligence, I'm going to begin to pursue standing firm for God. I want to be noted as a person of spiritual courage from this day forward. You and I can learn by one thing Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. He says, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence in, if anything worthy of praise, dwell 
on these things. Take some stands. This week, uh, one of my favorite singers is one of the guys from King, uh, for King and Country, one of the contemporary music, uh, Christian music groups. He said, you know, I, I used to sit there on my couch and I would read my Bible. I would have my phone app open to the Bible app and I would be reading the Bible and my son would come by every day or my sons would come by and they would see me and it never really did. And, and all of a sudden God him convicted of me and said, quit reading your Bible on your app so that your sons don't think you're just on your phone. And so he said he went and got a physical Bible, and he started reading his Bible every day physically in front of his children, I mean, as they would just be walking by. He said, here's what happened. Within a week of me doing that, my oldest son comes in, sits by me, and says, Dad, what are you doing? Well, I'm studying my Bible, and I'm journaling, and I'm, telling, I, I'm, I'm writing down what God's teaching me. And his son said, oh, okay. And he said, his son disappears. And his son comes back in a few minutes with his own Bible and his own little notebook. And he sits in a chair across from his dad and he begins to read. Look, some of the times our way of taking a stand on our faith is something as simple as that. As practical as that. Take stands for the truth of God in your family. And let your family know where you stand. The second thing, he says, is knowledge. This is talking about full knowledge, full knowledge of God, a relationship where we are learning and growing and doing those things that are practical in our relationship with God the Father. We're learning about that. You know, the, the Bible tells us before we became a Christian, we were considered slaves to sin. And as slaves to sin, we didn't know what God was about. We didn't hear his word. We didn't know how to apply it. But he says, now I call you friends because of that relationship. And listen to this. Jesus tells us that everything he heard from the Father, he told the disciples. And everything he hears from the Father, he tells us. We can learn it, we can know it, we can hear from God as we look at God's Word. In Proverbs chapter 15, 14, the first part of that verse, it says, The mind of the intelligent seeks knowledge. Now, this isn't talking about just general knowledge. Because you see, the Bible's concept is knowledge always begins with a proper fear of the Lord. If you and I are seeking our knowledge outside of a relationship with God, then we're going to learn some things, but we're going to learn them from a false direction. We're going to have the wrong look at it. So, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 10, it says, So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please Him in all aspects, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. You know, one of the people that I have admired in my ministry tremendously is a guy named Ed. He was a member of our church when we lived in Indiana, and I was his pastor for almost 10 years. One of the things that was amazing about Ed was he was a Sunday school teacher. He was a very busy person. He was in a professional life where he did a lot of training, a lot of sales, a lot of different things related to that. So he had an overwhelming amount of time that he spent in his work. But one thing that always amazed me is as a Sunday school teacher, he spent no fewer than 10 to 15 hours a week studying his lesson. And I would come to church, and our church there had three services, just like we've got three services in the past. And I would get there early, and, and I would pull up on the parking lot, and many times I was 
the first person other than Ed on the parking lot. And I'm thinking, I'm here 40 minutes early. Why is Ed already here? Ed's in his car going back over his lesson one more time before he presents the truth of God to the people that he's going to be teaching. You see, one thing Ed understood is that he needed to diligently seek the knowledge that God was going to give him so that he could give out that information to the people around him. You know what, folks? Many of us do a five-minute devotional in a week, and we call that seeking God. Many of us are leaders in a Bible study, and we spend a whole solid 30 minutes of pouring over our verse so that we can pour out the truth of God's Word. Listen, folks, we're missing it. We need to understand, we need to dig in deeply to the knowledge of Christ. So, you as a family person, you as a father, you as a mother, you as a child, God has given you the responsibility. You know, I have people all the time, well, if my, if my mama did this, if my daddy did this, if my wife did this, if my husband did this. Listen, you personally are responsible for planting this in your life. And you can be the one that starts to plant it in your family and, and make it very real. Third thing is self-control, something that's totally misunderstood. It's totally misunderstood. Because we're more in the mindset of the Greek culture the Hellenistic idea of self-control. Self-control means I'm man enough to get it done myself. I picked myself up. I got myself ready. I took on the things. I was tempted by all this stuff, and I was able to avoid the temptation. I was able to not eat those extra calories. I was able to do it all because of my ability to self-control. That is a Greek mindset, a Hellenistic mindset, not a biblical mindset. Because the biblical mindset of self-control means you and I are under the control of the Holy Spirit. You see, that's where it lies. Self-control from a biblical standpoint has nothing to do with us having a strong willpower so that we can overcome. It has everything to do with you and I giving ourselves over to God so that His Spirit is in control of our lives. Romans 8.13 says, For if we are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if, you, if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live plant into your family that idea of your life has to be controlled by the holy spirit by god's word by god's guidance by the wisdom that you are getting in there a fourth thing we see here is the idea of perseverance that is the idea of bearing up under trial your faith will be attacked. We watch that all the time. As a matter of fact, uh, over, I, I think, the number I sent you, Josh, I think was over 5,000 Christians since January 1st to mid-June in the world so far that we know of through the Open Doors program. Over 5,000 Christians have lost their life for no other reason than being Christian. Over 4,000 Christians since January 1st of this year have been imprisoned and are still in prison because of no other reason than that they know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. 
Over 350 million people in our world today are living under severe persecution for no other reason than the fact that they have Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. Now, you would think that many of these people would be going, oh, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't, I don't, I don't. You know what? The reality is the opposite. You go to these prisons and you talk to people and they, they would say, if they let me out today, I would go preach the gospel tomorrow. I think about Stephen, one of our, our pastor friends in, the, in India who was nearly beaten to death earlier this year, was, was literally left to die. Both of his arms broken, his back broken, his kidney punctured. He's gone through seven surgeries. He's 27 years old. And his desire told to us was the fact, I just want to get well so I can go back and tell those people about Jesus. I want to ask you something. Your faith, my faith, is it strong enough to stand up for something like that? Or are we sitting there going, oh, I'm worried whether or not someone will think less of me because I present to them Jesus. Or my family wouldn't like it if they knew I was Christian. My boss wouldn't like it if they knew that I was Christian. You see what? Folks, we need perseverance. We need the ability to stand up and share Christ in the middle of this. What are you going to do? I've, I've told people many times, you know, I, I hear people all the time, they'll talk about relational evangelism. I've got to know somebody for several years sometimes is what that means before I can talk to them about Jesus. I don't believe in that type of evangelism in this way. Because let's say Wisdom and I were friends at work and I had been telling him all these neat stories about my family and I'd been telling him all the things I liked and I'd been involving myself with him and I'd been building this relationship with him for five years. And then five years into it, I tell him about the most important relationship that I have in my life and that's Jesus Christ. You know what he believes? He believes I'm lying to him. You know how I know that? Because I hear the testimonies of hundreds of people throughout my ministry that have told me that exact same thing. They said, if Butch had a love for Jesus, they would have, he would have told me about Jesus in the beginning. But he waits all this time, and he doesn't do anything. I've had other people that have just simply said, you know, why in the world would somebody hate me so much that they would be my friend and not tell me about the most important relationship in the life? You know, folks, we, we sit here sometimes and we go, but, oh, but I, don't, I don't want to be uncomfortable. Matter of fact, my, my daughter told me of a young lady this week she was talking to uh, there in Texas, and uh, she had gone to China and, and worked uh, with a group of people, and it was quite difficult, the group of people that she was with. She was very uncomfortable with them uh, uh, because of the, the discomfort it caused her, and, and she just says, hey, I'm not willing to do that. I'm not going to do that. And before you judge her, you and I are the same way, aren't we? God says, you've got a race to run. You're chosen to run a race. Get in the race. Listen to what it says. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. God set a race for you. You and I are in it. Whether we think it or not, persevere. Another thing he says, have godliness. That's to look like God. 
Peter, in, in verse 3, you can read that later, but Peter talks about the fact that God is the one who provides all the divine power we need to have godliness in our life. The idea of godliness is a very practical idea which basically says you apply God to every situation. Oh, but I can't do that. Yes, you can. Do you think... Here's what you think. Okay, here's one of the things I think that will help you. If you understand that every thought in our world didn't come about independently, but it came about as a result of God, then everything involves God. In your work, you can involve God. In your marriage, you can involve God. In your family, you can involve God. Everything you're doing, every practical aspect of your life involves God. One of the best best biblical examples of this is Joseph. Joseph constantly looked back and said, God is the one I'm trying to please. God is the one. When, when, When he was being chased by Potiphar's wife, he says, I can't sin and do what you're asking me to do, not because of Potiphar, but because I will not do that because of my God. I don't want to be that in front of my God. When he comes to the guys talking about their dreams, you know, can you, can you, can you interpret our dream? No, I can't, but God can. When he comes to Pharaoh and Pharaoh says, can you interpret my dream? He says, no, I can't. You see, that's where we get mixed up so many times. We want to be very well thought of as being people who are on top of it all. Listen, Don't get shocked when you come and ask me a question and I say I don't know the answer, even if it's about the Bible. But the one thing I will tell you is we'll search it out. We can find it together. We can understand and know the truth. I don't have all the answers. I don't know of anybody who does. As a matter of fact, the people who act like they do don't. And so... One of the things we need to do is we need to become people who imitate God. That's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Imitators in every way. Also, we need kindness, brotherly love. This word is called, this is the word Philadelphia, which means, it's a word Greek, Greek word Philadelphia, which means to have a warm affection. It's used when talking about families. It's used about talking about friendship relationships. It's used when talking about a relationship between brothers and sisters in Christ. That's one of the ways it's used so that we choose to care and love for one another. Now, let me tell you, you this week probably had somebody that, as we would call in the States, pushed your buttons. In other words, they made you angry. The reality is they didn't make you angry. The reality is you chose anger. You may go, oh, but you don't understand it. You don't know what they did. It doesn't matter what they did. Your life, my life, is not controlled by outward circumstances. Your life and my life is to be controlled by the Holy Spirit, and we are to be allowing the Holy Spirit to allow us to love someone, care for someone. Preacher, you just don't understand. But then the last thing he says, love. And this is a sacrificial love. This is different than just the affection of love. This is a love that says, you could be my ultimate enemy. And I would still love you with the love of God. 
You see, that's exactly what Jesus Christ did for us. He loved us. This is the word agape. Agape love is not based on a feeling. You see, we, I, I, as a pastor and in marriage counseling throughout 47 years of pastoring, I've had so many people say, I fell out of love with my wife. I fell out of love with my husband. And we use that as an excuse of being able to say it's okay to walk away. You know what the Bible says? True love has nothing to do with your feeling. It has everything to do with your choice. Where you and I choose to love somebody. Again, that mindset of walking in love. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2 says, And walk in love just as Christ also loved you, gave himself for you, as an offering and a sacrifice to God, as a fragrant aroma. I, I liked what I read this week that somebody did. The next passage, I'd actually not originally included in my notes, but I went back on Thursday morning and made sure I put this back. And it's the First Corinthians passage from chapter 13. And it says, love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Love does not brag, is not arrogant, and does not act unbecomely. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not uh, rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they'll be done away. If there are tongues, they all cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. Love is what it's all about. But you know what? Again, the world gets this all confused. Love is not sex. Love is not a feeling. Love is not affection. Love is a choice which says, I will sacrifice all for you. Earlier this week, in one of the things I read, the challenge was to replace the word love. So go back to the first of this passage, all right? And replace it with I. Because as a Christian, you understand that love is the basis of what we're talking about. I impatient. Whoa, no, 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 that's not me. Yeah. I am kind and not jealous. I do not brag and am not arrogant. And do not act unbecomely. I do not seek my own and am not provoked. I do not take into account a wrong suffered I do not rejoice in unrighteousness, but I rejoice in truth. I bear all things, believe all things, hope all things, endure all things, because I will never fail to love. Wow. If you plant that kind of love in your family, what a dynamic difference it will make so this morning I want you and I to understand that the that there are a couple of benefits there we have fruitful and victorious lives and isn't that what we want and Peter says if you put yourself to where you're putting these traits in your life it's a no fail situation you will win you will be victorious you will grow your relationship not only with God but with your with your wife with your husband with your children 
with your parents. But one of the things that he does say is that your growth in these areas needs to be ongoing and constant. It's not a one and done. We're all growing. So I, I want you to know this, this day. If you've never given your heart to Jesus Christ, He loves you unconditionally. He doesn't say, get your act together, straighten up, and if you do, then I will accept you. You know, we have this mindset in our world, and I, I faced it two or three different times this week, where people say, I've got to prove I'm worthy of God's love. Listen, folks. Jesus Christ already died on the cross for you because of his love. Don't you think he already has declared you worthy of his love? He's not asking you to do anything else other than accept it. Would you do that? And then for all of the rest of us that already know Jesus Christ, would today we just say, Lord, I want to plant these things in my life. And I want them to take root and grow and bear fruit so that my family gets to benefit from that. And let me ask you something. You may be a teenager here today. You may be a, a single here today. I don't know where you are in your, in your marriage, in your family, in your relationship. But let me tell you this. You are who you are right now because of the choices you have decided to make. It has nothing to do with everybody else around you. You can give me the worst case scenario and I can point right back to you people who have gone through something worse and are nothing like what you think. But people who are joyous and happy and thrilled with a relationship with God. It's your choice. You are where you are spiritually because it's where you want to be spiritually. Today, say, I want more. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you right now saying we want more. We realize we are broken. We realize that there are difficulties that we will face circumstances that we won't be ready for, knowledge we won't have. We'll have people challenge us. We'll have family members that won't even understand. But today, Lord, we just say, help us to plant the right things in our life so that they will take root and bless our families. In Jesus' name, amen.